Hello, a warm welcome to today's walk. Um, it's one I've been on several times. Um, we start in Wyke, quickly working our way into Lomoa before returning back to our starting point in Wyke. Large sections of the walk will take us through industrialised areas, uh, but I hope you will soon realise how close history is to home. We shall learn about one of the country's largest UK factory disasters uh, and also find out what John Wayne's link to Lowmore is. So come with me and let's see what we can discover. First of all, these houses that you can see uh, were in the bottom half of Cat House Lane and it used to be uh, a cow shed when we first moved to Wyke about 40 years ago, now converted into two dwellings. Crossing uh, Huddersfield Road here, and we're going to make our way down the side of the White Collar Estate. Early on a Sunday morning, so we're going to catch a bit of the sun coming up to start with. Gonna be another nice day. I mean, from this point, uh, just going down uh, this alleyway at the side of this stage. Um, it's like you're finding lots of places in Bradford. You suddenly turn a corner uh, and you'll find something amazing. Um, and here we have Holly Hall Cottage. We're in Holly Hall Lane at the moment, uh, heading down. And we're now, when we get to the bottom of here, uh, onto Car Lane, and that's the uh, where we start to enter Lowmower. Looking that way uh, is the beginning of Star Hill. Now, anybody who knows Wyke uh, knows that Star Hill is the steepest street, and to walk up it is a challenge for anybody, regardless of your fitness, I reckon. 
Um, now the building that you see there that Pine Lap are occupying, um, there's two parts of it. The, the right hand side there, the large section, uh, you can just see the sort of imprint of windows and, and a main door. Now that used to be the Fleece Inn at the bottom of Saw Hill and lo local folklore is that uh, they used to stable horses there. Saw Hill, which is just around the corner, um, was the main road uh, centuries ago, the main road between Huddersfield and Bradford. So when the Carters and the Hauliers came with the wagons and carts um, they could seek refreshment at the Fleece Inn before tackling Star Hill with the load. Um, also because the, uh, the inn stabled horses they could rent horses to get some extra horsepower to get up Star Hill. There we are. Now this, this brick uh, through the two houses uh, is well known in Wyke and Lomo. A uh, bit of a blind spot if you come in a car and you have to slow down and make sure there's nothing coming from the opposite direction before you set off, uh, before you carry on, should I say. Um, the large house at right angles to the road is Witteron House, uh, named after Dr. Witteron, who uh, had his GP surgery in the house. Um, and is also the official uh, GP for the Lowmore Ironworks. Now the houses, all the residences there, the wall and the gateposts are all Grade 2 listed. So yeah, this wall, eight foot high, and you can see the entrance to the houses on this side has got like a cast castellated, is it, castle? design above the main entrance uh, and a beautiful gateway but you can see how small people used to be uh, two or three hundred years ago uh, oh no it's not so bad after all it just looks smaller than it is against the, the large wall at the far end of the uh, courtyard in there, there's a coach house. The house next door is also interesting um, as there's a, a date sign. Law Moor really came into being um, in the 1700s um, when Law Moor Ironworks um, was founded um, with then the influx, influx of uh, people, workers, um, houses needed to be built, churches, pubs and shops and, and that's how uh, the, the lawnmower uh, that we know now uh, started to come about. Just approaching the end here, I mean most of the street is uh, modern housing um, but on the end here we've got another Grade 2 listed property. Now this is 1 and 3 car, car lane um, but I did find an interesting story um, about somebody who lived at number four car lane, which would have been about where those properties are now, and no doubt were just stone built houses. The story is about Polly Hartley, um, who lived at 636 Manchester Road, um, and one day she was found clinging to branches in the, the water at the, the lake of Harold Park. Um, a gentleman who lived at Four Car Lane, uh, Henry Thomas, 
Um, he leapt in uh, and saved this lady. Um, police were called um, and she was taken to uh, the infirmary in a horse ambulance. So as we leave Car Lane behind, um, we move here into New Works Road, which goes up to Huddersfield Road at one end, um, and then down to Cleck Eaton Road um, that way. And all on the left-hand side is the uh, industrial plant Selenus or Selensis. Selensis. Um, now, when we moved to White, this was known as and it was owned by Allied Colloids Chemical Works. Um, it was uh, then subsequently taken over by Seba. Uh, look at that. Yeah, that looks like it's been a farm building, but it almost looks fortified, doesn't it, with the rifle slits. Uh, But we'll just get walking up a little bit and then I'll tell you about this fire. Okay, that should do. Okay, so. On the 21st of July 1992, um, a series of explosions leading to an intense fire broke out in a storeroom in a raw materials warehouse at Allied Colloid site in Lomoa. The fire spread rapidly to the remainder of the warehouse and external chemical drum storage. Although none of the company's employees were injured, 33 people, including three residents and 30 fire uh, or and police officers were taken to a hospital where they were treated for smoke inhalation. Approximately 2,000 local residents were confined to their houses and residents in eight properties immediately adjacent to the raw materials warehouse were evacuated. The incident was first noted by a forklift driver uh, at half past one in the afternoon uh, who saw fume coming from a vent in what was termed an oxy store. He set off the fire alarm which alerted the Works Fire Brigade. They, along with five senior managers and the safety manager, investigated and found that a number of kegs of AZDN, which is a reducing agent, and which had been stored on an upper shelf had ruptured and spilled their contents onto the floor and created a dust cloud. There was also a portion of a ceiling insulation tile on the ground Part of it, which remained in situ, bore the marks of impact from a keg lig lid. In the immediate vicinity of the spilled AZDN, there were bags of sodium persulfate, an oxidising agent. The internal fire crew brought up an appliance and laid out their hoses, but it was decided to clear up the spillage by means of a vacuum cleaner. By 2.15, the shift chemist could see that a reaction was taking place in or near a bag of SPS. A flame developed followed by a flash and he was forced to retreat. There was a further explosion, probably a dust explosion, which blew him over. By this time people were running away from the scene. The public fire brigade were called at 2.22 and began arriving at 2.28. There was thus a lapse of time of some 52 minutes between the first discovery, which resulted in the internal fire alarm being sounded, 
and the public fire brigade being summoned. The brigade found that it was facing an, in, an intense fire. At its peak, it required 36 appliances and 173 firefighters to combat it. The main's water supply proved inadequate and water had to be pumped from adjacent dams. The fire spread throughout the warehouse and smoke was blown towards nearby motorways. The fire was contained that day, but the fire brigade was not stood down until 18 days later due to the risk of reignition during cleanup. Considerable environmental damage in the Air and Calder rivers resulted from the fire water runoff. Allied colloids were convicted under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974, Section 2, on two counts and Section 3. The fire caused considerable local anxiety. I know people who lived uh, nearby and they were very angry about this accident um, as it knocked thousands off the price of their properties. Um, so it's 30 years now, I'm sure those values will have uh, gone back up again. But at the time, there was a lot of anger from the local uh, community about that. Went out to point out as well there, uh, it was somewhere just up there where that TV uh, mobile mast is that Morley Car Working Men's Club used to stand. Uh, the land has now been sort of swallowed up by the chemical plant. And I believe the members of Morley Car now gather at um, Harold Club on Huddersfield Road. We're going to walk just down here a little bit um, to the next street, Dealburn Road, uh, and I'm going to tell you about an even bigger disaster that occurred close by. Uh, this this garage and car sales um, is, is, is probably well known to a lot of residents in Low Morham Wake uh, on the way to the local household uh, waste centre. But I'm just going to take you here to the end of uh, Dealburn Road before I recount here uh, the explosion of 1916. Down at the end of uh, Dilburn Road, as the road bends round to the left, is the Bradford Council Household Waste Disposal Centre, which many will be familiar with in this area, um, but probably unbeknown to most. Um, opposite there, uh, there's a public footpath that leads up to a local nature reserve, Lowmower Banks. Now, on the site of that nature reserve, once stood the Lowmower Chemical Company, which produced picric acid, which was used to dye carpets. On the outbreak of war, the Lowmower Chemical Company was turned into a munitions factory and expanded to cope with the demands of the war. Monday 21st of August 1960 at 2.30 a man was moving pitric acid across the yard when he heard a sizzling sound. He turned and saw the fire which knocked him to the ground. 
There was no fire alarm to warn people of the impending danger, just people shouting to get out. The water sprinkler system was turned on, but no one could actually remember if any water came out. People ran for their lives. They knew a big explosion was coming. 10 minutes later, the explosion happened. It sent up a huge cloud of smoke and a fireball and was heard as far away as York. Debris fell for several miles around and the air smelt of bad eggs. Firemen for Bradford were called, bringing the Hayhurst, uh, the name of a motorised fire engine with them. They arrived at the factory and started to connect hoses when a second explosion happened and knocked the firemen off, killing six and seriously injuring the rest. Another fire engine from Odsell Station <coughs> was already on site but was crushed under a wall that fell over in the explosion, killing two firemen. The manager of the works directed the factory firemen, firemen from the railway and neighbouring factories. The manager was not seen for a few hours, then came crawling out on his hands and knees at 6pm. He was taken home, but died later that night from shock and poisonous gases. You may be interested to know that the, this gentleman lived at 700 Huddersfield Road in Wyke. The factory was next to the train line, train line and the man in the signal box telephoned in the explosion, set his signal to red to stop the trains and escaped in time before his signal box was destroyed in the explosions. The fire also spread to the nearby Bradford Gas Works, the gasometer exploding, sending up a huge fireball that was so loud a seven-year-old boy was apparently made deaf by it. Lots of people helped bring in carts to take people to hospital. The explosions continued for the rest of the day and it took three days to put the fire out completely. People had to stay with friends, family, some slept in woods or sheltered in schools. The factory and gas works were destroyed, a neighbouring factory seriously damaged. 50 houses had to be demolished and 2,000 were badly damaged. Windows blown out, chimneys down, doors off hinges, ceilings down, roof tiles broken, that kind of thing. Train lines were ruined, 30 railway carriages destroyed, 100 badly damaged. Three schools had to close. Now, due to the war, newspapers were not allowed to report what had happened or where. However, thousands of people from across Bradford came to see for themselves what had happened. It became a tourist attraction. Word of mouth spread and thousands of people came out for the funeral procession to thank the firefighters who helped and pay respect to those who died. Medals were given to all the firefighters involved. Now there was never any recognition uh, of the civilians who had perished in the disaster um, until on the 100th anniversary in 2016, uh, Lomo Local History Group um, funded a memorial plaque that was placed close to the site uh, and you can find this on a boulder also with uh, some inform other informative plaques about the uh, explosion on the Spen Valley Greenaway which is, runs close to the site. Uh, this garage which a lot of people in the area will be familiar with from coming to the uh, household disposal site down Newburn, like Newburn Road um, was once a mixed infant school, later becoming a girls' school. Now in 1916, when the explosion occurred, this was one of the few buildings relatively intact and it was used as a temporary mortuary. The school never did reopen uh, due to the damage and the blasts and the explosions uh, and pupils were moved to Car Lane School. I mean it's not hard to imagine the school as it was, uh, as seen in this picture. Now, the, lo the local lads who were, who were stood there against the wall uh, would have been stood roughly where the tree stump is now.
So yeah, next time you come to bring your rubbish to the household waste site, just spare a thought for the victims of that terrible explosion in 1916 and the bodies were housed in here. Okay, so we're going to continue the walk now. Hope you're enjoying it so far and learnt something. Um, so all to the left here, massive plant um, of selen selensis. Okay. So we're going to carry on here down New Works Road. The sun's getting a bit higher in the sky now, so uh, a little bit easier for filming. All cement works by the looks of it. So this is just uh, crossing the end of Station Road here, which uh, gives you a bit of a clue what's further up. When we get to the end of New Works Road, up here short, shortly, it forms a junction with Click Eaton Road. Uh, and there I'll be to give, tell you about um, an eyewitness uh, to the 1916 explosion and how we made a bit of a dramatic escape. Like I said, it's uh, look, looking like a fine morning in for a, another nice day. We'll September next week. A lot of cafes in Lomore, uh, due to I suppose you know the number of employees and workplaces that are around. Just here on the right um, is Lomore Station. Now the old Lomore Station. Uh, had been closed down uh, but then after a lot of campaigning it was reopened uh, a new one was built should I say uh, on a slightly different site to the old station because uh, the former lines had sort of closed uh, but this new station opened in 2017 um, and it's been a success it's been used very well uh, it's great facilities you can just come and pack your car for free uh, and then catch a train either to Bradford and then on to Leeds or York uh, from there um, or the other direction it's trains, even trains to London uh, but you can catch a train to Manchester, Chester for example we've had quite a few good days out uh, catching the train to Ebden Bridge which is only a short journey uh, but yeah well Good asset for Lomore, I think, is, this, is the reopening of the station. Now, I mentioned um, a, uh, an eyewitness account uh, to the explosion uh, and, the, and the after effects of the explosion. Um, his name was Percy Nudds, and he owned the shop on the corner here of Cleck Eaton Road and New Works Road. And Percy did an interview in 1972 about the Lomo uh, munitions explosion um, which appeared in the Foster Society's booklet about Lomo in 1972. What he says, Percy says, that the Lomo chemical works was making picric acid during the war 
on Monday the 21st of August 1916 a lady uh, came into my shop which was situated at the corner of Cleckheaton Road and New Works Road for some sweets. Though hard to get in wartime I had a few chocolates in stock and as I weighed them out she asked me if I knew um, that the Lomo chemical works were on fire. I said I did not know uh, and when she had paid for her sweets I went, went outside with her and saw from behind my shop the flames coming from the chemical works which was situated just off New Works Road. As soon as I saw the fire, I realised it, that it was out of hand and that a major explosion was almost inevitable. For one of the magazines, of which, of which there were several, was well ablaze. Asked me what she should do and I, uh, I advised her that if there was time, she should go and tell her uncle, the manager of the gas works. For my part, I told her I was going into my shop to take all the money out of the drawers and with what stock I carry I would get away on my cycle as quickly as possible but I was certain the explosion was inevitable and that a great deal of damage would result. I, in, incidentally just over the road here uh, down the side of the George Hotel you see the street still paved with the original stone sets and these are what the streets um, were paved with um, in, in Loma of old uh, when there was a row upon row of terraced properties. Now the large house you can see in the distance is the beginning of Railway Terrace. A lot of those houses suffered incredible damage in the explosion of 1916 uh, and one, one resident, a lady, was blinded in one eye from the flying glass. Anyway. Back to uh, Percy N Nudds uh, and his attempts to escape uh, the effects of the blast. So Percy had got on his cycle from outside his shop and he pedalled up Cleckheaton Road. So Percy recounts, I just reached Moreland Terrace when the magazine blew up. Now this is uh, Moreland, uh, uh, Moreland Place, that's it. Um, so I think he's referring to these row of houses as Moreland Terrace. So he would have, would have cycled up when he got a short distance when the, he heard the explosion felt the explosion. It is. Everybody was really frightened for it was a tremendous bang and large pieces of stone, slay, iron piping and metal were falling from everywhere. Every house had its windows blown in, its doors hanging off and slates stripped from the roofs. Percy says, strangely I did not feel much of the blast as I was protected by the houses which were close together. My mother was visiting Undercliff Cemetery with her sister when she heard the, the explosion. So Percy continued up, up this road um, he said people were running up and down hardly knowing what to do. I got on my cycle and went up Salroyd Road. Now we're just going to approach Salroyd Road. Salensis works still on the left. Thank you. 
And here we are, Solroyd Road. So Percy cycled up here. As Percy cycled up Salroyd Road, um, he noticed away to his left a couple just coming out of the Wesleyan Chapel. And the story of that episode is that uh, the bri bride was cut with flying glass, um, but they managed to save the wedding cake uh, by throwing a cloth over it. So Percy was cycling when he got almost to the top of Salroyd Road, just to uh, a second explosion happened. This being about 30 minutes after the first one, I was showered with glass from the greenhouse of the large house and I had to shake myself free from it. I went to the fields near there and whilst I was there, the third explosion occurred. This was the gas meter which had punctured in many places by the falling debris. The gas escaped in a huge cloud which exploded and burst into flames high in the air. We could feel the enormous heat from it as it blazed, though we were more than half a mile away. Uh, people were coming to the fields from Wesley Place and other streets and many of them had been injured. Those we helped and attended to as best we could. Now the next street is Chapel Road. Um, this is where the Wesleyan Chapel once stood. The buildings, there'd been two chapels. Um, one was demolished in 1905. And then the second one, which is like based on the Italian design, was demolished in 1959. Now, only the graveyard remains. There are old photos, and I'll try and put these, these up, um, of the chapels, and they would have been about where that, you can see the, the, the houses are and the rear of this car. Um, the photograph was taken from about this position. Uh, you see the gateway and that large gravestone to the right. Many people in Wyke uh, will know all about Judy North. Um, now, she was a lady who lived in, in the woods near Wyke. Um, I think there's about five or six woods, all with different names. Uh, they're now known to get collectively as Judy Woods, after Judy, who lived in some cottages in the woods. Uh, and would make money by tending some pleasure gardens and selling ginger beer and selling parking pigs. Her father-in-law um, is buried in this, in this cemetery. Uh, I don't know which is the actual grave plot, but just as I've walked, walked in and by the, uh, by the large tree at the entrance, notice this half a stone in affectionate remembrance of Edmund and Francis, children of John and Nancy North, both of whom died in their infancy. So, I'm not an expert, maybe they were, were uh, Judy's children, uh, sorry, Judy's um, siblings. Or a, 
a husband's siblings, would it be? Yes. Anyway. As mentioned earlier, um, that some houses were built in First Street um, to re replace the, the ones that had been demolished near, near the scene of the explosion in 1916. Now these houses were built in 1919 as replacements in First Street, and this is First Street now as we come out of the cemetery. Uh, although you can't see from here, we're not going to walk down there. We're at the end of the street on either side of the road several properties with red stone and uh, pebble dashing and they were the houses that replaced the ones demolished So back out here, emerging from uh, from First Street, coming back onto Clecky Eaton Road, making our way up. I'll just cross the road because there's an interesting building here on the corner. So that building is the old cooperative store. Um, I think there's a date on the uh, date at the top. There we are, 1831. Great architecture. So to the right, um, we've got row upon row of uh, residential properties. Still to the left, uh, the industrial units. We've got the sun behind us now. We've got another cafe open over there. Freedom Caravans. Now I mentioned Judy North's um, father-in-law being buried in the old Wesleyan Chapel uh, graveyard. Judy North was apparently um, buried in a plot um, in the uh, Holy Trinity graveyard, which is just about another hundred yards up on the right-hand side. Not going to be going in there today, uh, <coughs> but it's understood to be like a a plot where a number of people are buried. Um, Studio had three husbands, <laughs> not all at the same time, um, so I'm not sure 
if she's buried with her husband uh, and his family. So as Cleckheaton Road bends to the right, it's making its way up to uh, Odsall Top, home of the Bradford Bulls. But we're not going that far up today. We're going to uh, cut through at the end of the road here into a small park area where stands the Lowmore War Memorial. Starting to see one or two people out and about now. So here we have uh, Lowmore War Memorial. There's quite interesting inscription and the wording. So what it's saying is to the sacred memory of the men of Lomoa who served their king and country and lost their lives in the European War 1914 to 1918. The memorial was erected by public subscription and was unveiled November the 10th 1928. Now I say the inscription is interesting, that's the first time I've ever heard what we call the First World War, World War I, uh, as the European War. Uh, as we go around, uh, still the plaques left from uh, commemorations past the Bradford Pals Battalion. So the Pals were battalions that were formed up, it was like a recruiting uh, tool for the army <clears throat> and they would gather people from the same town, city uh, and form battalions so they were all closer comrades uh, I guess believing that they would fight better to, you know, together if they were all from the same uh, town so as the 1916 explosion was occurring in uh, Low Moor, just about half a mile down the road, um, the Bradford Pals were getting decimated at the Somme, the Battle of the Somme. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm just le leaning on my own memory with that. Moving round, now you see the plaque says, remember also those who fell in the Great War, 1939 to 1945. So, I've often seen the First World War, 1914-1918, referred to as the Great War. So obviously, after such a conflict, nobody could imagine the world going to a war for a second time. But interesting that what we call World War II is here called the Great War. I suppose they couldn't call it World War II without changing the inscription on the other side to read World War I rather than the European War. Uh, so maybe that's how that's come about, but interesting, never seen that before on a war memorial. Uh, so, there are some cider drinkers come here on a night, I don't know. Um, but here, we've got a happy bench. Sit here. 
Sit here if you don't mind someone stopping by and saying hi. If you'd like a copy of this sign for another bench, then please email the Happy Bench Project at gmail.com. Let's spread some love, people. Nobody needs to feel lonely. There's a Facebook spread a little happy, spread a little sunshine. Twitter at Happy Benches. There we are. Lovely idea. Stand that up again. It's nice. Okay, we're now going to continue out of this little park area. Um, we're going to cross um, the end of uh, Common Road as it meets Click Eaton Road. So as we cross the road here, um, we're in the bottom half of Netherlands Avenue. There's a very interesting Grade 2 listed property on the right, known as Lomo House. You can just see it through the trees. Now Lomo House was built around 1750. Uh, substantially enlarged in 1791. The original house of three storeys was lower than the main block and was adopt adapted as the service wing to the new residence of 1791. So a large enough house to have servants. Uh, the 1791 enlargement was built for one of the directors of Lawmore Ironworks. Lovely tree lined avenue. At the top of here, um, there's a Tesco Express. So I get a bit out of breath. Shows how on fat I am. Two years of uh, working from home. Crippled my health. <laughs> And yeah, trying to do daily walks now and increase my stamina. Netherlands Avenue is bisected by uh, Huddersfield Road. <coughs> uh, and it continues over the way where the camper van is that goes right up to Halifax Road. To the right is uh, Oddsall Top. Just cut through, here's the Tesco's car park shortcut. Just over the road there is uh, Cello Heights School. Goodbye. We're on the left lawnmower club. It's for sale. Never been in there, so I don't know what it's like. All are welcome. Oh, 
Okay. Horse tied up here. What's he got to eat? Yeah, biscuits, crushed, yeah, broken biscuits. All right. I don't mind a broken biscuit. Can you still buy broken biscuits? Oh, it was always a thing you could buy them, couldn't you, in shops? As we walk down here, we start to uh, hit a sort of little shopping precinct. Edged down the side of the road by a couple of pubs. I think the one on the left, the British Queen, is, is closed now. Uh, I'm going to cross over here. This is a memorial I want to show, show you. Um, and it's outside the drop kick. Is this the only dropkick pub in the UK? Probably is. Perfect name though, so it's close to the Odsall Stadium. Yeah, so the memorial I was uh, referring to is this one here, outside the Dropkick pub, as I say, in memory of Eddie McGuinness, Odsall Sedberg, amateur rugby league club. Well, Eddie was tragically killed in 2009 on leaving this pub, uh, I think it was on a Saturday evening. He'd been to see a big game of rugby, a semi-final, um, and spent the evening here. Uh, and as he went to cross the road, presumably to the British Queen, uh, he was hit by a speeding car uh, and tragically killed. But Eddie had stints as a fitness coordinator uh, for Salford and also Bradford Bowls. And he was highly regarded within the rugby league family. So, as we move away from the drop kick, <laughs> there we have a few shots here. Just over the road, Lux Lounge. Again, it's my understanding that uh, where the, the fence borders and there's like the remains of a, a sort of stone wall, uh, there were shops all along there back in the day. But one thing I do love, and I love to try and spot them wherever I go, uh, are former picture houses cinemas and here we have the former Low Moor Picture Palace. Now the main entrance was on the side where that sort of timber clad entrance is now. Um, I'm getting this information courtesy of cinematreasures.org. It started life as a Brotherhood Mission Hall but opened as a cinema on the 14th of September 2014. Initially it had seating for 526 people but this was later reduced to 490 after they introduced like a, a state-of-the-art uh, sound system. Right, uh, I said at the beginning of the walk um, 
I'll let you know about the link that John Wayne has to Lowmore. Well, this is it. The last film to be shown at the Picture Palace was Reap the Wild Wind on the 15th of June, 1957, and it starred Ray Milland and John Wayne. Now that, that film must have been on its uh, second, second circuit, I reckon, because I think it was made in 1942, so 15 years later, it was shown in Low Mower. But what's interesting is that what we've got here is like the entrance um, to Bolton Street. And Bolton Street is now a road to nowhere. So the original stone sets, and I'll try and put up a picture of what this looked like back in the day. So it's now, looks like it's a manufacturing place for kitchens and bedrooms, picture house photography and studio. So there's still some sort of link to its cinema days. Um, I mean, after it closed as a cinema, um, it reopened as a bingo hall in 1964, uh, which lasted until 1983. We've got Common Road, so this cuts right through to uh, Clackheaton Road, where we've just come from. Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Peter Sutcliffe used to work as a wagon driver for a firm somewhere down there, and they actually visited, the police visited the premises and uh, try, trying to you know, discover who the Yorkshire Ripper was. Another cafe. Industrial units. Just another industrial estate on Lawnmower. So we seem to have walked around with keeping the industrial units to the left and the residential properties to our right. <coughs> so many people think of Bradford as being grey, dark, smouldering place. Really, you look at the streets and just see how green it is. Nearly every street is tree lined. Not very far from the end of the, the walk, or well, back to our beginning. Uh, this is the Lowmore Medical Centre there on the right hand side. That is what I call a, a new build. Just under the shade of the tree, um, we're, we're approaching uh, Harold Club. As we do so, uh, there's a big stone marker here. Welcome to Low Moor. There we are. And over here is one of the flywheels that stand as a monument to the ironworks.
huge. Let's see what it says. If you can get some sense of the scale. I'm six foot. And then across New Wits Road once more, uh, the Harold Club. show you what year this was built but built for the working men of Lomar certainly Victorian and the Victorians didn't mess about like even the working men's club it looks like a grand family house even some sort of like Stonework there above the door. That's not the main entrance. Uh, uh, the Harold Club, function room for hire. And I believe they do sort of West Coast swing dances, classes in here, Northern Soul Nights. And as I say, the demolished Morley Car Working Men's Club uh, members uh, meet here now. But they still really retain the identity of Morley Car. Well, I've been at Half Mass for quite some time now. Could be a, a club member who's passed. I just want to show you over the road something you probably never see again car for sale quite an unusual car and if you've got 2695 pound and you'd like to buy a car covered in grass then this is your chance I mean have you ever seen anything like I wonder if it was a travelling artificial turf salesman's car. Yeah, like I say, I don't think there's two of them. As we, we make our way back to the start, the road divides here. The lower road goes into Wyke and through the main centre. And this road leads up, it's more like a bypass. Now, a lot of people who, who aren't local to the area would probably assume that this road that we've walked along, Huddersfield Road, continues up there, but it doesn't. Huddersfield Road is the the offshoot almost and that continues through so that was the old road through to Huddersfield through the village and clearly as the village expanded and we'll see as we walk further up on the right um, Delph Hill uh, estate was built and, and other newer housing that a bypass type road and an accessible road for those properties was needed. So going up here is Woodside Road. Before fur further along through the village, it then joins up again with Huddersfield Road and continues as Huddersfield Road. St Mark's Church, which we can just see through the gap in the trees, 
uh, was built in 1857 is a grade two listed building. No longer a place of worship, uh, though the graveyard remains. It's now split into uh, plush apartments. Very expensive to rent as well, last time I looked. So we're on the rise. Um, just looking down, down here at the end of the street, see the two gate posts, uh, and then there's an old building on the left, uh, which was once the lodge for Royds Hall. And this was like a one of the driveways that led up to Royds Hall back in the day. The lodge was ex <coughs> was a, was a added to, um, but the lodge still remains part of the current building. Royzal is probably the prominent house in this locality, and was that's where the lord of the manor lived. There, you can just see part of what the what was the lodge, and uh, just look further along the outline of the front of the property. You can see those gateposts. So that was the lodge to Royds Hall. Right, the magician dynamo or Stephen Frayne to use his real name, uh, proud of his Bradford roots, he's always mentioning Bradford in his TV programmes uh, and he was brought up on the estate that we're just approaching on the right hand side now unfortunately when he was a, a kid he were, he were bullied and the two kids who were supposed to be taking him to school would bully him each day so each day he was getting beaten up and they would, uh, one of the, the things they would do to him, they'd put him in a wheelie bin and roll him down a hill. Now, someone told me that this is sort of the hill that they chucked a dynamo in and used to throw him down in a wheelie bin. Um, story goes that Dynamo's uh, grandfather uh, was, was his hero and, and he would teach him little magic tricks and one day it showed Dynamo how to make himself so heavy that nobody could lift him. <clears throat> so he learned this and then the next day, as the lads were trying to put him into this wheelie bin, he did this stunt of uh, somehow transferring his weight so it was impossible to lift him. And after that, they never tried again, but they spread the word that he was an alien. Now, <laughs> now me... My daughter used to go to White Manor School at the same time as Dynamo and they used to see him and he was never seen without a pack of cards in his hands so he'd be walking from lesson to lesson shuffling cards and clearly, you know, practice makes perfect so he's now one of the world's top magicians um, My daughter has a story she was on a bus with her friends uh, going to Bradford, they were sitting on the upper deck and uh, sat next to Dynamo because they kind of knew him um, and, and they were chatting and all that and said, oh, do a trick for us, Steve, you know, Stephen. And so I says, right, to, to me daughter's friend, have you, got, have you got a coin? So she had a 50p, did this girl, she gave Dynamo the 50p and he did some sort of trick, wizardry, and the next thing you knew, the 50 pence was outside the window of the bus on the upper deck and they were there and they could put their hands on the glass and they could see this coin but they couldn't touch it and that was that's something that he just did off the cuff one day traveling to Bradford on a bus I'm gonna cross over here into the centre of the road. Go 
because we're only about 100 yards away now from our starting point. And there we are, that's, that's the entrance uh, to Delphi Estate that I was talking about. I know, not so long back, somebody did tell me that uh, some of his family still live on this day. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, there's the signpost as the entrance. Delph Hill Roids. There's a premier shop there, and on the other side, Spice Ranch. I've been in the premier in at the premier in the premier quite a few times and people in there are very friendly so if you're ever in this area and you want a pint of milk go in there hope, hope you've enjoyed this walk uh, if we weren't stopping at all the places um, it's, it usually takes me 45 minutes to do this route so let's have a go but I hope I surprise you by just how much history there is on your doorstep. So until the next one, uh, stay safe, dodger and out.